Okay. So we talked about artisans and we talked about enslaved people. And now I'm going to talk about the people who were kind of on the ragged edge of American industrialization before the Civil War. And these were textile factory workers in the urban north. As you can see from the picture here, um, factories were set up with, uh, these are water driven axles with belts that come down from the ceiling axles to drive the machinery. Um, you can see in this picture women working because the workers were largely women for reasons that I'm going to explain. Um, that machine that is on the left hand side of the picture is a roving machine. It's um, combing the cotton all in one direction and making it into a roving, kind of like a thick, um, a snake like piece of cotton. And then those rovings will be woven or will be stretched and spun into the thread uh, in a, um, a spinning mule or a spinning jenny. And you can see those very large spindles of thread being um, being twisted and wound onto spindles at the right hand side. Now you can see there is a woman who is under the machinery all the way on the right hand side of the frame. She's got her hand stuck in there. Um, there's lots of places for people to get injured in these early textile factories because there's no safety apparatus. Nothing is closed off. And in particular, the job that the person is doing under the spinning frame um, is the thread would often break because it was under tension and being twisted. And what you had to do was to get under there and to stick your hand in there and um, kind of move your thumb and fingers together to ravel the thread back together. That job was called piecer, that job designation. And Little piecers could start at the age of maybe eight to 10 years old. The majority of the girls who worked in these factories were between 15 and 24 years old. So this is definitely a young woman's occupation. This gives you a non sort of pictorial view of what the mills were like right before they closed in the 1920s. So um, Lowell, Massachusetts is now a National Historical Park. You can go into various buildings that used to be either um, worker boarding houses or the actual factory floors and see um, the, the machinery in motion. It gives you a sense of how loud it is. You really have to put in ear protection and they wouldn't have had it they wouldn't have had any ear protection in the 19th century because no OSHA. Um, let me show you what it sounds like if I can get you two to work. All right, so you get an idea. You get an idea there of both how loud the machinery was and also how mm, Rube Goldberg-esque it seems to have been. That is, 
You know, this machinery was designed in the US, although it was the result of industrial espionage, uh, as I'll explain to you in a minute. And what you see here is the various parts of the machinery kind of imitating what a person would do if they were hand loom weaving. So um, the uh, instead of with a hand loom, there are pedals that you push that move the, um, the warp up and down so that you can throw a shuttle back and forth, a shuttle that contains a spindle thread. Here, the um, instead of pedals, the uh, alternate parts of the warp are being lifted from above in those wooden frames and a, a kind of wooden, I don't know, little sledgehammer thing is hitting the shuttle back and forth. So it's kind of like somebody decided to make a robot that looked as human as possible and made that into a, a piece of machinery to make cloth faster. Um, So I talked about the market revolution and you understand why it is that Americans would want to make their own cloth. So uh, they wanted to do this. They didn't want to have to be dependent on uh, British imported textiles, but also there was no such technology um, in the United States. And so in 1810, a young man by the name of Francis Cabot Lowell went on a trip to Britain and he pretended that he was, you know, just interested in cotton mills and stuff. And he memorized as much of the machinery as he possibly could. He was in a sense, one of the first industrial spies. When he got back to the United States, he worked with an engineer named Paul Moody to build from memory and trial and error the machines that he had seen and even to improve on them. He and some associates from Boston, thus historians call them the Boston Associates. They didn't call themselves that, but as John Green has pointed out on more than one occasion, historians are very uncreative when it comes to naming things. The Boston Associates said, where can we build an industrial city? And they chose Lowell, Massachusetts, because in Lowell, there, were, there was a river, still is a river, that had enough of a drop in it to power wheels, water wheels, that in turn would power machinery. The first cotton mills, as I said, were run by water power. And then later they get converted over to um, steam power, coal. The city of Lowell was named after Francis Cabot Lowell, who died in 1817 at the very beginning of this whole thing. The new thing about the Lowell system was its workforce. Uh, young single farm women were brought in from the Northeast, from farms in New Hampshire and Vermont, with the point being these uh, agents, mill agents, would talk to their fathers, or talk to the girls' fathers and say, look, we know your daughter, your unmarried daughter is just another mouth to feed, but she could have a really great job at the mill in Lowell and she'll get paid a goodly wage. She will live under supervision in a boarding house with you know, 10 or 12 other young women in a room. The boarding houses are all managed by respectable widows. She will make about $3.25 a week. Of that, about a dollar twenty-five will go for room and board, so she'll be clearing a whole two dollars a week, which is, you know, that's good money. That's money you wouldn't have otherwise. That's cash. 
Not only that, but we will make her go to church on Sundays. It is a requirement of the local workforce that they attend church because we know that you would not allow your respectable daughters to leave home otherwise. Once young women went to Lowell, they tended to be the best advertising for jobs in Lowell. They would write home to their sisters or cousins, tell them about the great opportunities that were available. So there was a kind of chain migration from these northern farms down to Lowell and Lawrence and Merrimack, New Hampshire, and you know, various other mill towns that grew up. Workers, these young female workers had some, you know, agendas of their own. Sometimes they wanted to save up money so that they could get married. But sometimes their families had fallen on hard times and they sent their wages home to support the rest of the family. Many of them put their younger brothers through high school by sending money home. Uh, all the factories had boarding houses attached. And as I said, they hired mostly widows to run the boarding houses. There were not too many good opportunities, economically speaking, for widows in this time period. Um, because men were supposed to be the heads of the household. So this was one of the only jobs that widows could do to kind of support themselves. Sewing was another. But the young women lived in boarding houses. They lived in big um, ward-like rooms that might hold 10 or 12 girls, two to a bed. Side note, in the 19th century, like up until the Civil War, if you went to a hotel or boarding house or something, you got half of it. And you didn't really have any control over who got the other half. The girls had a curfew of 10 p.m. And they got off work at about 7 p.m. and then had an hour for dinner. So they really only had about two hours in the day to do everything that they needed to do. Repair their clothes, write home, read books. Um, just whatever it is you need to do for sort of daily maintenance purposes. The boarding houses were immediately alongside the factories. And when you came to a factory, you didn't come with a specific job offer in your hand. Rather, you would go from one room to the other in a particular factory and ask if they needed hands. And whoever the overseer of that room was, was normally a guy. You know, they, they did have male bosses in these factories, um, would say yes or no, we need somebody, we don't need somebody. The first six weeks that you worked were unpaid. So you were learning the job on the job. You might be um, operating one of the spinning machines, piecing together the threads. You might be overseeing some looms. That loom that I showed you, uh, each girl would be assigned four of them. Two in front of her, two behind her. It's, she sort of stood in the middle of that. And if anything went amiss with the power loom and she didn't stop it in time and fix it, then she would be docked pay for the screwed up piece of textile. There really weren't bathroom breaks. Um, you started work very early in the morning, especially in the summertime when the days were long. So you might have to get up at five o'clock in the morning, have breakfast, be at work at six or 6.30 work until noon or 12.30, have half an hour for lunch, go back to work again and work until you know 6.30 or 7 p.m. Initially, the hours of the day were about 14-hour work days. 
with a half a day on Saturday. Uh, finally, church was mandatory, as I said, on Sundays, which were the only day off. Um, and you had to, in order to attend church in this time period, pay pew rent. So when you went, in order to be able to sit in the church, you paid a fee out of your slender earnings. But as we're going to see, a lot of this takes place during a time of great evangelical fervor in the United States. So for most of these young women, they didn't have to be pushed too hard to go to church. Anyhow. Uh, this is occupational portraiture, just like we saw in lecture 16. These two women are dressed as they would be dressed to work in a factory. So, you know, wearing dresses and aprons and having their hair up like this. Each of them is holding a shuttle from a power loom. The shuttles are made of wood. Spindles fit into the shuttles. And then at the end of the shuttle, there is a metal cap and it's pointy because when it goes back and forth in the loom, it's getting hit by that little wooden sledgehammer thing. And so you don't want the shuttle to get destroyed. The problem is if that little sledgehammer thing breaks, and the shuttle goes flying through the air, you can get badly injured by the very pointy object. So people lost fingers, people, you know, got into major injury accidents when their skirts or their hair got caught in the machinery. Um, many of them contracted tuberculosis because these shuttles, in order to thread them, uh, there's a little hole and you poke the thread through the hole, put your mouth on the shuttle, and then breathe in. So that is how you thread the shuttle. It's called a kissing shuttle. And the shuttles, you know, moved all around the factory. It wasn't like you had your own. So tuberculosis was transmitted that way. Any, oh, I have time discipline on here. I should talk about that before I ask about any questions. All right, when you work on a farm, when you're a young woman working on a farm, you don't clock in at six o'clock in the morning and clock out at six o'clock at night. You have tasks that it may be your job to do. These tasks depend on the day. There are some reasons you might have to get up early, like milk the cows every day, but it's not the case that you have to milk the cows for 12 hours a day. All right, so what ends up happening is people are very used to task orientation of their work. It makes sense to start and finish a task, to bake a pie from beginning to end, rather than to like cut apples over and over again for 12 hours. When you go into a factory, you are not doing a task that has a beginning and an end. You are completely at the mercy of the machinery. The, there were bells and clocks that dictated the workday. And this transformation to time discipline from task work is thought by historians and anthropologists to be a major transition for people, like something that's kind of unnatural for humans to do. One of the major scholars of this phenomenon, a guy named Edward Thompson, who died in the 1990s, he said that when people don't have to clock in and out, they tend to gravitate toward task orientation. Um, so students and um, stay-at-home mothers, you know, people who have more control theoretically over when they do certain tasks tend to not be like, okay, now it's nine o'clock, I do this. Now it's 10 o'clock, I do this. All right, so there was a big mental adjustment for people working in factories. Are there any questions so far? Um, how was the facility in the, in the boarding, boarding facilities? How was what done? 
How was the, did they have switch system? Or how did that oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they did not have indoor plumbing yet, so there would have been outhouses. And if you wanted to take a bath in this time period, you needed to fill up a hip bath with hot water. So people normally bathed only about once a week. And um, because it took a lot of time to heat up water for multiple baths. Uh, outhouses, you know, had um, seats over pits where, you know, sewage would end up. And then there would be people that would come along with wagons, often referred to as honey wagons, and they would clean out the outhouse and then take whatever was in the outhouse and that could be used to fertilize crops. Um, but it was kind of like living in porta potty land um, before the advent of indoor plumbing. Okay. Good question. And were they multi-story, the, the boarding houses? Um, they, the ones that exist today, yes, are multi-story. They tend to be two-story brick buildings. And um, they had, I have never seen a boarding house um, at Lowell National Historical Park that was set up like a an actual sleeping arrangement. But what they did have the first time I went to Lowell in the 1980s, I guess, they had a, a meal, like they showed what people would have eaten, and it was the most food. Like it was a crazy amount of food. I can't imagine any person eating that much food, and especially not in half an hour, but I guess you needed a lot of food to be able to get through a 14 hour day on your feet. Any other questions? Uh, yes, one more question. Uh, I know in past lectures we talked about unionism and all that. Mm -hmm. um, did these female factory workers, did they have the same kind of uh, representation or because of their gender, they were disregarded from unions? In general, they were not welcome in the union movement uh, during the 1830s, although they did facilitate their own strikes. Those of you who did the primary source the other day that was about the 1836 strike know that the girls turned out to protest a cut in the wage rate. Um, and it was pretty easy to get these young women to, um, to come out for a sort of ad hoc kind of strike, um, sometimes even for a while. But yeah, the gender politics of the time meant that there weren't um, continuous women's labor organizations in this period. You don't really get those until the formation of the Knights of Labor in the 1870s. That's when they start unionizing a lot of women. Um, there were two major strikes in the 1830s. There was one in 1834 in Lowell and one in 1836. And when the women turned out of the factories and struck, they talked about how they were the daughters of fathers who had fought in the revolution. And so they were not going to be slaves, they were not going to be oppressed, thus using the same kind of language that um, artisans were also using in the 1830s. But if they really hated the work, they were much more likely to just vote with their feet and leave because women had other options in this time period. They were not really expected to be the family wage earner. They could teach school. They could go west. They could marry. So, you know, when conditions in the mills got bad, that's what people tended to do. Um, in the 1830s, there were the couple strikes that I mentioned to you, but in the 1840s, there started to be a more organized movement for change. This was called the 10 hour movement. And what they wanted was a, a 10 hour day instead of a 14 hour or a 12 hour day. They wanted Massachusetts to pass a law limiting the workday to 10 hours. 
they tried to get an audience in front of the Massachusetts legislature, but they were refused on the grounds that it would be unseemly to allow women to address an audience of men. The state of Massachusetts did debate, though, whether a 10-hour day was going to be a good thing. And they decided that it would put them at a competitive disadvantage. That if New Hampshire wasn't going to have a 10-hour day, if Rhode Island wasn't going to have a 10-hour day, then by limiting Massachusetts to a 10-hour day, they were going to limit their own profitability. The reformers who called for the 10-hour day in the 1840s, I'm skipping around a little bit on the slide, formed themselves into something called the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association. It was fairly short-lived, but it was the organization around which the 10-hour movement cohered. They produced a newspaper in conjunction with some other you know, male labor movement members called the Voice of Industry. And they use some of the same language as the artisans that I told you about in lecture 16. They talked about equal rights. They produced a series of tracts about how bad the factories were. In contrast, the factory owners had their own propaganda. They set up a magazine called the Lowell Offering to which the women were invited to participate, um, to contribute. It was poems and stories and autobiographical essays about their lives, working in the factories, whatever. And the point of the Lowell Offering was to show people how educated these women were, how not oppressed they were, how far they were from the impoverished, uh, immiserated English workers. There's the occasional tiny bit critical essay in the Lowell offering, but for the most part, it was a propaganda weapon for the, uh, for the mills. Any questions on this page? The Lowell Mills became a kind of symbol of America doing industrialization the right way. American industrialists said, look how beautiful it is here. We barely have any smog. And you know, part of that was they were using water power. Um, our factory workers are educated, they're well-dressed, they only work in the mills for a few years and then they go off and get married. Um, people used to come to visit Lowell as a kind of tourist attraction because there weren't too many tourist attractions in antebellum America. So places they would go included the Lowell Mills, Niagara Falls, uh, Washington, D.C., where you could actually watch Congress in session and meet with congressmen and senators. Um, sometimes great people would go to the South and see plantations, but that was usually off the beaten trail. And then ironically, American prisons were a big draw for foreign visitors because America was on the leading edge of prison reform in the 19th century. So people liked how we did our prisons. Foreign observers were impressed with the contrast between American industrialization and say British industrialization. They believed that you know, Lowell was doing industrialization right. But again, the labor reformers, like the women in the Lowell Female Labor Reform Association, 
we're saying we are the wage slaves. You know, we work these long hours, it's very painful. Uh, 14 hour day is very bad for the constitution, for the physical constitution. This wave of Yankee mill girls ends in the late 1840s. As the experience changed, the wages got lower, the number of looms people had to watch got increased, the speed of the factory increased. And so new migrants to the United States began to take their place in the mills, starting a a kind of repeat procedure that happened that new immigrants would take the place of factory workers from older migrant waves. So this first wave of migration that happens is due to the Irish potato famine of the 1840s. A million people from Ireland migrated to the US. And the vast majority of the migrants came to Massachusetts. Uh, people, the mill girls who really still depended on their wages from the factories, looked down upon these new immigrants, said they're willing to do jobs for a pittance because they live in crappy conditions, they don't have a lot of energy, they have few aspirations, they're taking American jobs. But ultimately, you know, the Irish really did replace the Yankee Mill girls. Over the years, then the French Canadians came in, then Polish workers came in and others from Eastern Europe. And finally, Southeast Asian workers, each group bringing its own sort of enclave, its own little self-contained community. And the Yankee Mill girls were right about one thing. The people who came in who didn't, um, didn't speak English as well or didn't have as much of a history in, in the country had a harder time, you know, fighting back against the incursions of, you know, speed ups and lower wages and stuff like that. All right, so now you have heard about three different groups of workers. If you had to compare and contrast them, you would be able to do that probably. So that might be something that you want to think about.